Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Misam, and thanks for the introduction. And uh, before I begin, I want to thank MX Media and Avneet uh, for presenting us the opportunity to be at this uh, event today. Um, the, my topic today is, uh, is going to be about best practices in steel design. Um, through this topic, I wanted to just touch up. Uh, my intent was to show what kind of work that has been done already in structural steel, uh, not primarily through TT projects uh, that has been done worldwide, to, to show you the scale, complexity, and uh, different sectors in which uh, structural steel has been applied. And um, also, I would like to recap and touch upon some of the basics on uh, steel design uh, for some of the younger members in the audience, both engineers and architects. Um, OK, so I'm mean, carrying on, starting. Um, just a little bit of background about the company. Uh, Thornton Tamasetti is a structural engineering uh, company. We've been in the business for over 50 years. Our uh, vision is to innovate and you know, reinvent uh, how we think of uh, design, how building design is carried out, how buildings are put together. Um, we have uh, 26 offices worldwide. Uh, Mumbai is our only office in India. Uh, we've been here since 2010. Um, as you can see, I've really taken to the 33 degrees Celsius Mumbai dressing already. I've abandoned the suits. Um, the different practices that uh, the company offers at this time are building structure, uh, building skin, uh, building performance, property loss consulting, construction support services, and building sustainability. Uh, building structure uh, deals with new building design. Um, could deal with any kind of new building structure which has an architectural element from uh, um, aviation, aircraft, uh, air, airport terminals, to cruise terminals, to malls, uh, you know, stadiums, long span structures, high rise buildings. Um, the other services um, as they are self-explanatory, but at this point we are not offering the services in India. Uh, building structures are only, sir, is the only service being offered through the India office at this time. Um, some of the projects that I wanted to talk about, or some of the sectors that I wanted to talk about today, were um, aviation, uh, stadiums, um, cruise terminals, cultural buildings, um, commercial, institutional, healthcare, just to demonstrate the vast breadth of application of steel in building structures. Um, and I see that, and I've, I've noticed that in the earlier presentations too, that is very, uh, and we learned that too here, that there's a very tight uh, commercial quotient in India where, uh, where structural steel is not most often looked, looked at favorably. Um, but we think that could change uh, as long as, as this market grows and becomes more mature and, there, and more players get into the market. Uh, the increased competition will help bring down cost and uh, provide value to owners in the long run. Um, the, the idea of showing different sectors is also is, is to display, um, and, and I'm going to talk about why individual developments or owners do go for structural steel as a, as a construction material. Um, it is not always driven by costs in terms of economy. At certain times there are constraints such as you have long spans and cantilevers which, in which uh, reinforced concrete is just not a feasible solution. Um, the first project that I'm going to talk about is the Baku Olympic Stadium. Um, it's a 225,000 square meter, um, 68,000 seat uh, stadium. It is being done in Baku, Azerbaijan, and by Thorne Tamasetti. It 
on that we're working as um, on a design build team with the contractor tech firm and uh, Hiram is the architect um, this is a very fast track schedule the stadium uh, the stadium schedule right from beginning to completion of construction is 18 months um, and um, as engineers we partnered I think uh, Girish made a good uh, observation about the design build earlier on and this is one instance in where we've collaborated with the with the contractor to be on the design team where uh, where 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 decisions can be taken where time is of the essence of how simplic how simplicity can be adopted in in design to to make it more efficient in in time um, so one of the of course from from a steel point of view the highlight of of this uh, of this structure is the roof uh, the cantilever roof and the tie backs uh, for the cantilever roof, the, the floor framing, which has been done in you know Kambaza steel beams, or the girts that support the facade. Um, this is only the second uh, stadium project, which is using uh, translucent ETFE uh, facade panels. Uh, so it's not much so much like the Allianz Arena, where it is more opaque in this. Uh, you would actually have uh, light pass, daylight pass through it. Um, our skin practice did help with uh, the peer review of the materials on this project. Um, the next project is um, the Carrasco International Airport. Uh, this was done uh, in Uruguay. Um, again, um, very interesting in design. The architect, uh, Rafael Vignoli, had a um, he wanted to imitate the the hills of in Uruguay, uh, what he calls the rolling hills, and uh, such was the shape of the structure. Um, again, thousand foot long monolithic steel structure. Uh, so the urban um, stresses did take uh, you know a little designing to get into. Um, the I mean uh, the the terminal, the three hundred forty five square thousand square foot terminal. Uh, the efficiency that was being being obtained in architecture uh, as well as or there's a slight premium probably in structure for the open column free spaces inside um, was there were uh, some v-shaped columns that were set on two ends of the of the terminal with large uh, north south spanning trusses um, to create a column free space internal to the terminal um, our next project is a, is a very garden variety aircraft hangar uh, that is done for uh, FedEx's uh, A380 hangar in Memphis, USA. Um, the, um, in this, of course, we did a few runs in terms of trying to figure out what is the best, uh, best optimization on options of, of trusses or the arrangement of trusses. Um, the structure is uh, 400 feet by 300 by 150. Uh, we have 400 foot span, 45 foot deep trusses that span. Um, you know, uh, there are 400 foot span. There are 30 feet on centers, uh, and so in effect, you just have a one-way truss system and bridging trusses in the other direction. Um, this, um, I think, and the, one of the interesting aspects of the design in this one was the seismic detailing on the on the steel connections, because it was in a higher seismic zone. Um, the additional items to, that were to be conveyed to the contractor at the time of design documents is, of, which is critical for long span structures, is to be aware of um, construction sequencing and uh, what kind of deformations you would expect depending on the sequence of construction. Uh, what are the what are the truss deformations? What are the cambers that the, that the contractor needs to build up to to, to reach the theoretical um, top of steel? Um, it's another interesting structure that would classify it as in the cultural uh, slash mixed use uh, space. Uh, this is the Qatar Education City Convention Center done in Doha, Qatar. Um, 
the concept was done by uh, Aota Isozaki of Japan, and the NTT was hired by the design build contractor on this project, uh, who hired both the architect Yamasaki and then Thorn Tamasetti. Um, this was uh, again a very large, about 200,000 square meter uh, uh, project, which uh, very large span uh, ballrooms, open areas. I think the largest ballroom was around 40,000 square meters. Uh, and um, the, it had about 50 meter by 85 meter clear column free spaces inside. Um, the, it also housed a um, auditorium, which is a 2300 seater auditorium, uh, which, was, which was isolated as a structure within a structure. Um, again, there was a very interesting shape of the auditorium, the way the architect wanted it coming through. Uh, which required S-shaped so sloping columns that were built up in steel. That's just a snapshot of, uh, of the auditorium. Um, I think, uh, I mean, in, in this project, we, we ended up using precast concrete as a deck slab on the floor um, and just composite steel beams. Um, the, the tree that is shown uh, up front in the image, that is the Sidra tree, the national tree of Qatar. Uh, that is, it gives you the illusion that it's holding up the roof, though in reality the roof is cantilevering over and it's just laterally restraining the, the tree structure, which is just a, a sculpture. Another sector which is very common in the United States to, to work with in structural steel is healthcare. Uh, I'm, we don't see that much often in, in, uh, in India. Uh, one reason being because hospitals actually they own and they are working through the space, through the, life through the life cycle of the structure. So they would like to make changes, additions, or modifications to the structure. So their uh, structural steel comes in very handy in terms of making modifications. Um, it's easy to add or stiffen up an area if you're putting uh, heavier loads or, you know, uh, a heavy imaging facility that you're trying to change the use of a space on a particular floor. Um, and if you had to make renovations or additions in the, into the structure, it, it's, it's much easier to work with structural steel than reinforced concrete. Um, the project at this point that was done this place uh, was the Rush University Medical Center, uh, about 845,000 square foot uh, new addition to an existing facility. Um, pretty standard uh, slab on metal deck, floor construction, composite steel beams. Uh, lateral system in this case was uh, uh, shear walls, reinforced concrete. Um, I mean, you'd see there's about two or three very common systems that are, that are emerging in, in steel buildings. Um, your lateral system could be a ductile shear wall or a, normal RC shear wall or could be a brace frame and your gravity systems are pretty much your, your slab on metal deck with or it could be a precast concrete plank depending on how uh, and what is available in terms of the market locally. Um, the next project uh, is uh, Penn State University. Uh, it's the Millennium Science Center. Um, this it was the new material science wing edition uh, at Penn State University. Um, the, it was originally conceived as two individual buildings, but uh, later for function they were clubbed together um, and made an L-shape uh, footprint. Uh, what is interesting in this building is there is a very sensitive material science laboratory at the base of the building where the roof cantilevers over. Um, and in order to not, for column vib vibrations through the building, not to travel through the columns back down into the, to the facility uh, in the basement, the, the columns are stopped 150 feet on, away from the, from the laboratory. And uh, it's state of the art high end uh, laboratory. And so that's pretty much what was driving the design in this case. Um, so the architect did come up with the suggestion and, and he wanted to cantilever over the structure on two ends. Um, 
was probably two sides, 150 foot cantilever over, um, which again could be achieved with structural steel. Um, again, this is a constraint. We could not do this with concrete. So to, in order to meet the vision of the client as well as the architect, steel was a natural choice of material. Um, another use of steel, as uh, I think uh, the earlier presenter mentioned, is commercial high-rise buildings. Structural steel is very common as, uh, as a material. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit reverse in India compared to the US. Uh, in New York, all, pretty much all your, res all your commercial buildings are in steel and your residential buildings are in just uh, flat plate concrete. Um, in India, pretty much all your residential as well as commercial buildings are, are, are full, are concrete. And I think the commercial buildings now even use post tension slabs to reduce the to reduce the floor to floor. I mean to increase the clear height and reduce the slab thicknesses. Um, a little bit of a challenge if you want to cut a stair opening into it at some point. Uh, though I mean, it um, that's where I think steel comes in handy to to owners uh, in in the building who are actually holding the building or holding the property and leasing out space at some time. Uh, through the life cycle of the building. Uh, of course, they do. they do own the steel material at the end of the life cycle, like was mentioned earlier. Uh, but yes, uh, again, steel being very flexible, very easy to work with in terms of uh, modifications of the space to different tenants coming with different requirements. I mean, if you have a tenant coming, taking six floors up of your building and wanting to put his own interconnecting stair across, guess what, you can't do that in a PT slab. Uh, but it's easily achievable in structural steel. Um, this project um, was about 1.7 million square foot, 52 stories. Um, again, very standard uh, slab on metal deck uh, construction, composite steel beam. Um, there were uh, lateral system was uh, concentric brace frame as well as exposed uh, steel, bra uh, steel uh, bracing system. The, I think the challenge was the, to get the aesthetics correct uh, for the external bracing, for which we actually had to get a full mock-up done of the, of the connection and get it uh, approved by the architect uh, beforehand. Um, the structure that, the, uh, the other structure that I was talking about earlier was, um, of course, what has led us through in our knowledge in what we've worked up till date and what has you know, given us a holistic uh, experience with steel before. And we wanted to try and apply those concepts in, into our Indian market. And, and, and as explained earlier, yes, it is not very common to use steel buildings in India. Only very, very select projects which require a need uh, get built in steel. Uh, the Rajasra Bhavan National Tax Headquarters is one such project in New Delhi. Uh, and the, I think the, the site constraints that were there, um, they required that the building be suspended. Uh, and so, so we had to put roof trusses across to nine concrete cores and hang the nine-story office building from the roof truss. Um, so this, I mean, this was very unique, not been done in India before. It has been done abroad, uh, but it was the first time that is happening here. Uh, this project is currently at, at tender stage and it's, it's being worked on. Um, I think the, the in, in, in working on this project, we had, uh, we had local support from uh, Vistar Architects, and then we had another tie-up with uh, a local engineer, uh, Mr. Mahindra Raj in New Delhi. And uh, his firm was handling the concrete work, and we, TT was holding up the steel end. And we were working with CSA Partners out of Chicago for it. Um, and I think the, the only reason I'm trying to put this up is to 
it, with this project, we, we did have some learning experience of how steel works in India. And uh, I just thought I would take this opportunity and share that uh, with, uh, uh, with the audience and, and collectively from what, what our experience has been working in the West versus then working on our first steel project in India. Um, but before I get into my lessons learned, I just want to highlight a few you know, uh, important aspects in steel design, just for some of the younger members in the audience. Um, um, the main characteristics uh, that, are, that we're looking for with structural steel in design are strength, serviceability, um, fire protection, very important aspect in design, and uh, corrosion protection. Um, these very basic important factors in design of structural steel. Um, strength we can design for the, the, by codes or the materials available. Uh, there's a lot of literature um, I mean, available on design, how to go about it. Um, serviceability, um, this is usually where, uh, where it starts getting interesting with experience getting into working with steel, where it's not just about, you know, uh, just deflections, L over 360, but uh, what are the elements connected? What is the effect of deformations on those elements? Uh, flow vibrations, as, we, as more and more that we start making structural steel lighter and longer spans, uh, what are the effect on the occupants of the structure? Um, fire protection, very important for structural steel. Um, it's something that needs to be worked out with the architect earlier on in terms of what is the, uh, what are the fire rating of different structural elements. Um, and of course there's corrosion protection, usually not a concern if you're indoors, but if you have exposed structural steel, uh, definitely can be, uh, uh, could be a problem, but it's something that, that could be treated. So that should not discourage um, us from using structural steel in an exposed environment. Um, it's a recap of strength. Uh, we have columns. Uh, it could be columns, could be W-shaped columns, could be tube columns. Um, tubular sections are most efficient sections for columns uh, just because of their geometric property and their shapes. They have their uh, they have equal properties in in either direction. Uh, there's no weak direction for a tube shape if it's square or circular, and uh, um, so it has a higher allowable stress against buckling. So what, that's what helps tubes perform much better than W-shaped columns. Although there's a little bit of a if you take a designer's point of view, there might be a, there could be problems with connectivity or achieving connections with wide flange shapes. Uh, when you're trying to work with tubular, tubular sections and columns. So, um, so yeah, as designers, you always battle between picking which shapes. Uh, nine times over ten, you end up using a W shape because it's easier to connect. Um, where beams are concerned, uh, your beams are, uh, your eye shapes are the most efficient shapes, wide flange shapes, um, because they have the masses, uh, they have most area of the of the, of the section towards the extremities uh, was 80% of a cross-section area of eye shape is at the flanges. So they were high, as higher section modulus and uh, definitely proves to be more efficient in design uh, than a tube section. I would say an eye, if you were to use an eye shape, you'd probably be, uh, or if you were to use a tube shape for pound for pound, you'd probably be 30% more material using a tube shape than an eye shape in a, column, in a beam. Um, but some things that need to be, even though you have an advantage of using eye shapes that are, it's how you use those that is important. Uh, if you are, if you have, I mean, what is the, the concept of lateral partial buckling? What is bracing the compression flange of the beam? Uh, what is bracing the beam? Uh, usually not a concern if you have deck, um, you know, rookie mistakes that can happen. Um, Number three is uh, of strength design, your typical floor systems where you have metal decking these days, uh, which would allow for unshored construction. Um, just the image to indicate to you 
more graphically what the metal deck looks like and um, how is it connected to, to steel beams. Um, I think the advantage of using metal decking as one of the previous presenters was talking about is it's very critical in if, if you're trying to achieve economy in structural steel design is you want to reduce your piece count. It's, it's, it reduces your overall tonnage as well as, as reduce your picking of, of shapes. Uh, but that is that's only possible as far as the deck can span. Uh, so, and I think we have some. Um, I was actually used to design to 240 or 33 ksi decks in the U.S. And here it's I think more advanced. We got 50 ksi 350 grade decks, which can span longer. So, which is good news. We can make them span longer and reduce our piece counts in India. But there is a challenge with metal decking, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, because there's a lack of standardization about metal decking available in the market. Um, another option that, that's available, uh, of course, is you could do precast plank. Again, uh, precast plank could span 15 feet, 20 feet, and you could uh, cut down your piece count. Uh, again, uh, depending on the availability of the material in the market, how many suppliers of precast plank are all already there in the market uh, will drive the cost up or down and how make it competitive or non-competitive against metal decking. Um, the steel beams can still be designed composite. Precast plant with topping, you can still have studs on the steel beam and make them design composite. Um, so the recap of serviceability, uh, I mentioned something about deflections earlier on. Um, it's just not about spend by 360, it is the finite amount of deformations. It's to understand what is your facade panels that are outside, uh, how many joints in the facade panels. Uh, lesser number of joints could mean larger, larger movement joint requirement for facade panels. Larger number of, jo larger number of joints could reduce that. Um, and, <coughs> and that's something that, that just could be coordinated with the architect. Uh, you know, while you're going through a design process. So there is gravity deformations or there is lateral deformations on facade panels which could cause racking in the panels. Um, this is a little bit more about facades. It's, it's, it's not just about how facades, uh, the deformations of the structures per se, but it is the, is the connection of facade to the structure also. That's an important aspect that needs to be considered. Um, where is the facade connected to the structure? Whether it's connected to the top flange of the beam, is the force is coming right into the slab? Is it coming on the bottom flange of the beam? Is it going to torque the beam or twist the beam? Uh, that's something you know that, that needs to be looked at in terms of design. What with the design team and the facade manufacturer, what details or what kind of support he requires? Um, there's ways to get around it by putting kickers or you know secondary beams to brace, bracing beams. Um, around it, so but it's important to get that on the drawing earlier on. Um, and impo another important aspect is is the flexibility or detailing in facades, where uh, where uh, I mean it's most often lost in detailing, where the amount of flexibility to allow tolerance and erection. Uh, a steel, structural steel tolerance in erection could be one in 500 out of plumb in a tall building. And what is that tolerance level that is being provided in the detailing to allow for facade connections? Um, AIC has, uh, has a bunch of, a series of design guides which are very useful uh, for engineers um, and both architects to understand uh, you know, different details or elements, whether it means from uh, facade attachments to, to vibrations to, to different connection aspects. Um, another aspect of uh, serviceability in design that, that does not get often looked at is uh, vibration. Um, now I understand in, in typically in India where after you build an office space and you put again four inches of screen on top of the floor might, might not be a concern, but most countries don't put that much load on, on the structure. Uh, 
the idea is to reduce the load and make it more uh, uh, more uh, efficient. Uh, and um, what what does happen in in that scenario is that uh, for I mean, for instance, where you are doing 40 foot, 45 foot span, 18 inch deep steel beams, which are composite. You know, you're giving you yourself large column free spaces, but because they are lighter and they are more susceptible to for vibrations. Now, this would have not been a concern about probably 30 years ago, where in office interiors were floor to floor partitions. Uh, but in the modern office environment, where it's more of an open office and there is less floor to floor vibrations, which which for flow flow partitions which dampen out vibrations, uh, this is becoming more and more of a concern. Um, AISC has a good design guide how to work around it, how to recognize, uh, how to calculate flow vibration, acceleration perception, and uh, it has gives you enough guidelines in, in terms of what is achieved, what is perceptible, what is acceptable. Uh, fireproofing is an important cost item also that is associated with structural steel. Uh, when, you, when structural steel is, has its weakness when exposed to fire, um, with high temperature it's going to lose its strength. So uh, fire protection is important. Now that's something that to be worked on earlier on in terms of what is the fire rating requirement for different structural elements, beams, columns. Um, slabs with the architect depends on egress of the building, the type of the building. Um, but he's doing a class A office space. Um, the fire protection options are from uh, cementitious spray on fireproofing, or uh, they could be intumescent paint. Uh, what is important to realize is it's not just specifying paint, it's, it's the fabrication. In the shop, when the fabricator uh, does the surface prep, uh, he needs to do correct surface prep so that the, so that the primer adheres to it, and then the and then the topping paint adheres to it. Again, quality control issues. Um, similar criteria with corrosion. Again, it's with coatings. Uh, corrosion can be taken care of or uh, delayed uh, through uh, applying coating systems. Um, I would not say any steel structure is corrosion proof. Uh, but with periodic maintenance, uh, it has been done. Uh, there are bridges, steel bridges, that have been standing for over 100 years, uh, which have been maintained properly. Um, some of the local challenges that we faced in India, in, in our learning so far in India. Um, I think the first thing that we learned uh, was that there were not a whole lot of shapes to choose from when we started designing. Uh, so just to give you a, a, an example, the lightest shape that was available here is a 30 kg per meter section, which is a, or sorry, it's a 45 kg per meter section, which is a W1430 in, in AISC. Uh, and, uh, and the lightest shape that we could make is probably W1422, which is a 33 kg per meter section. If you put these beams at 10 feet on center, that's probably 0.36 kg per square foot right there, additional that you're putting in tonnage. And you put that for a 1 million square foot building, so you put that many additional, that much additional tonnage is sitting in that building. Uh, again, because there is no, the lightest shape being rolled is is a 45 kg per meter section, there's not much of a choice unless or you want to import that section. So, so there is a little penalty in structural steel at this point just because the market is not quite ready in terms of availability of, of material. Uh, of course, you could use an option to do a built up, uh, a built up section to match the same properties, but then you're still putting the premium in the built up section. So, uh, perfect. So the, if the base case was a road shape of 33 kg per meter, every cost is being added to it uh, to, to achieve that. In, uh, and uh, I think if, if anything, if there's a few steel fabricators at this, uh, at this event, and uh, the more road shapes that can be produced in, uh, and increase the range of variety on the lighter beam shapes, that would help 
you know, reduce tonnage for designers and make structures a little bit more efficient. Um, the, uh, the other challenge that we had uh, is, of course, with built-up shapes being of such, when you end up using build-up shapes, there is the, the India code has plate grades which, which increase thicknesses, the, the yield strength reduces. Uh, so we end up using a slightly more premium, or you start using a higher grade, the E410 grade steel, which could again be a cost premium. So I guess what I'm trying to drive at is pound for pound, what building that we could design effect more economically in the West, that to deliver that design at this point in India, there is a premium being associated just because of the market not being that ready at this point. Um, which I think in, in structures where there is no option but to use structural steel, the owners are just have to bite their lip and you know, take that premium on. But steel as a material for it to be used more commonly in the market uh, should not have to have that premium. And, and if it comes to that and that choice needs to be made by the owner, uh, and we would like to give him, present to him the most economical option of structural steel. Um, another challenge uh, that we've come across is number of quality fabricators uh, in India. Uh, is any certification required? Uh, which is the body which requires the certification? In, in the United States, AISC requires fabricators and erectors to be certified. Uh, the current IS code 800 uh, only stipulates that the fabricator should be certified by some approved agency. We don't know which one. Um, so, and I mean, like what was mentioned earlier, that brings, and those fabricators who are quality conscious and are, are doing this on their own, do bring quality, but there, there are a few limited in number. Um, I think, oh, the last challenge was the, um, the lack of uh, uniformity in backing profiles. Um, there is no steel back institute in India at present. So uh, different manufacturers are adhering to different standards of uh, preparation of, of back sheets. Some are using British standards. Uh, some are trying to use Indian standards. Um, there is no uniformity or one uniform set of table that is available across the market where if, I mean, at present you have some manufacturers manufacturing 60 and 80 mm deck sheets. There are some manufacturers who are sticking to 50 mm deck sheets. Um, so there is no, there is no standard as such at this point and there doesn't seem to be a, a code by which they are being uh, governed. I mean, as best practice, they, are, they, are, they do adhere to British standards or trying to adhere to American standards, but that is missing in, in, in the India at this point. Uh, so it could be challenging at, at points where you have to satisfy some authority or somebody asks you to say, okay, is this acceptable by India code? Guess what? We don't have one yet. So we have to use the next best thing. Um, so um, that's a little bit of what we had today and uh, in our presentation. Thank you for your time and uh, we'll take questions, I guess, at a later time.